Okay, I, I want to uh, thank everyone for joining this session today, which, which is entitled The Potential of Drop in Biofuels to Decarbonize Aviation. Uh, my name is uh, Jack Sadler. I'm uh, based at the University of British Columbia, but I'm fortunate to, to work with Jim McMillan. Any of you who caught the earlier session uh, today, uh, Jim and uh, many members of our Task 39 were presenting this morning on marine fuels policy life cycle analysis and other aspects. So the session today is focused on decarbonizing aviation. Uh, uh, within our discussions within Task 39, uh, we have been looking at decarbonizing all the transport, but there's uh, been a focus for the last few years, both on marine and uh, aviation, because we think these are two sectors that are very hard to electrify. So what we're hoping to cover today is, uh, I think we've got some of the best people I know who are going to be presenting within this panel. Uh, we've got four speakers who I'll introduce uh, momentarily. Uh, also, some of you might have noticed that the IEA, IEA headquarters just released the Renewable Energy Market Report today. So it just came out today. And you'll see a session there on uh, uh, biojet or sustainable aviation fuel. So I think the present today, presentation today is extremely timely. So our, our format today is that we're going to, each of the uh, presenters will, will, will give a talk. We'll take time for a couple of uh, questions after that, and then we'll move into a panel discussion at the end. You'll see we have uh, uh, predominantly uh, American presentation today, partly a reflection of the time zone uh, in, in terms of uh, people being able to present. But uh, I think uh, Ernesto, Marco, if you want to pull up the poll, one of the things that we're going to use here to try and stimulate discussion is I would encourage you to look at the poll here, give us a sense of what you think is a priority, and we'll probably revisit the poll again before the panel discussion to see if that stimulates discussion. The other uh, housekeeping items is I encourage you to use the uh, question and answer box, the Q&A, so that as each of my colleagues is uh, presenting, uh, we can refer to that to uh, try and answer any questions that are not covered in the presentation. So again, I encourage you to look at our, our presenters today. I, I think uh, they're all superstars in this area. Uh, our first speaker today, uh, Sean Newson, who's from Boeing. Uh, we're being fortunate, our group has been fortunate to work with Boeing. I think it's a real champion of this area. So uh, Sean, I'm going to uh, hand over to you and I look forward to your presentation. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Jack. I'm happy to be here. Um, wish I was actually in Canada with you, but you know, maybe someday. So I'm going to uh, set a little bit of a context for um, at first why um, drop-in fuels are um, important for aviation, why it's the, the critical enabler for decarbonizing our sector, um, and then also to talk a little bit about what what Boeing is specifically doing. Next slide, please. Whoa, um, can you go up one? Should be one before this. There we go. Oh, yeah. Perfect. Thank you. So uh, aviation um, was, was actually the first sector to establish sector-wide goals for uh, decarbonization. So back in 2009, we, we set three goals, one, one for fuel efficiency up to 2020, uh, second one for carbon neutral growth from 2020 going forward, and then a third long-term goal, um, which was to have our emissions by 2050 relative to 2005 levels. Um, and we held that, that goal for a decade, but as, as the world pivoted towards uh, net zero, it became clear that that was the, the, the way that, um, the, that the aviation needed to go. So we, in just this past um, October at the IATA um, annual general meeting, the aviation sector announced a, a new recommitment to net zero 2050 emissions for the entirety of the aviation sector um, by, by 2050. Um, we were the, the first, again, we were the first sector to have any goal of this sort, sort before. And so we are happy to be um, leading the charge and in, in, in lining up behind the, the net zero 2050 goal. That is a goal of the entire aviation sector, um, the manufacturers, the airlines, the airports, the air navigation service providers, um, all of the sectors. Obviously, the, the fuel consumption itself, the emissions itself, primarily comes from the, the airlines. Um, 
but the the entirety of the sector is is in support of um, of that. We we recognize that it's an industry wide challenge. Okay, next slide, please. So the way the way we look at how to decarbonize this, and this is really the the Boeing framing of it, um, is really four pillars of action. So first, uh, fleet replacement. So and we, we like to put an emphasis on that because we want we want people to to recognize that. The latest generation of air, airplane technology is still in the relatively early stages of deployment. So 787s, 737 MAXs, 777 X airplanes soon entering service um, are, are still a minority share of the global fleet. And they have tremendous potential to, to avoid emissions going forward. We don't wanna lose track of taking advantage and capturing the benefits of the, the investment we've made as manufacturers and as airlines over the, over the past um, decade or so. Um, operational efficiency, um, modernizing the ATM, um, you know, incremental improvements to, to the carbon footprint, continuous improvement in how airlines operate the, their aircraft, how the um, eliminating waste in the air traffic management system, utilizing the aircraft to their maximum potential through seat density, load factor, getting, you know, maximizing any given airplane on any given route. Um, is, is all part of that. And that, that's a significant, but, but not the most important contributor. And then beyond the, the current generation and their operations, which is um, where aviation has you know, continued to, to put its um, investment over the, the past decades, there's also that looking forward, the, the potential for another generation of airplane technology before we get to 2050. And that generation of technology um, has the potential to pull in new forms of energy, including electricity um, stored in, in batteries or in hydrogen. Um, but SAF, um, SAF is also a renewable energy source. It's a renewable energy carrier. And, and that's and the drop in, the drop in um, characteristics of SAF are what makes it really um, put, um, attractive. Um, hydrogen, uh, battery electric, SAF are all energy carriers for a renewable energy transition across the energy sector. So ultimately what we need to do, the key enabler to transition to meeting our net zero 2050 goal is a transition from fossil fuels into renewable energy sources in those three forms of energy carriers. Next slide, please. And so as, as, the, as an industry under the Air Transport Action Group, ATAG as we like to say it, um, we, we've done a study known as Waypoint 2050 lots of acronyms, um, looking at the, the potential of airplane technology into the market and the energy carriers that those aircraft would be able to use over, over the coming decades. Um, we did this study first for release in 2020 and just this past September released an update to that report and this chart um, reflects that update. And, and what the, that study effectively says is that one, the, the preponderance of the emissions come from long haul and medium haul flights so they're the, really the core markets of Boeing, so 737 size and up airplanes. Hundreds of emissions across the aviation industry come from those market segments. Um, and the preponderance of the technology that's, that's viable between now and 2050 really relies on SAF. So from, a, from an aviation industry perspective, um, if we wanna decarbonize aviation, SAF is essential. Now those other technologies, the electric, hydrogen, hydrogen either in the form of fuel cells or in combustion have potential. They're expected to enter the market and in some respects they are already starting to enter the market, particularly in, in very small electric vehicles. But those small vehicles that are most amenable to those alternative forms of energy are also contr contribute the, the least amount of, of carbon emissions. And so there, are, there will be alter, opportunities to, to insert individual aircraft into the global fleet, into aircraft models, to make up a segment of the, uh, the global fleet and, and transition a certain amount of the energy consumption from fossil fuels to, to battery or hydrogen. But the preponderance of the emissions are, is going to come from SAF. Um, and, that, you know, and how much kind of depends on how optimistic you are and how about the potential of hydrogen in, in, in battery electric powered flight. And not just the optimism, but the realism of what actually happens over the coming decade and, and how that transpires. But the, but the nominal assessment from this study was that, that electric and, and hydrogen have the potential to enter the, the short haul and medium haul markets in the 2030s and 2040s. So it's, it's coming, it's not quite here yet, 
um, but there is a tremendous amount of technology development to, to be done. Next slide, please. And so as, as an ATEG study, um, we looked at a, a few different scenarios of, of how those different technologies can enter the market. And, and, and the, the, the approach of the study was to, to then backcast um, whatever couldn't be achieved through um, energy reduction. So you know, better, more efficient aircraft and energy transition into hydrogen and electric um, and backcast in the amount of SAF. And, and the, the gist of the, the study results is that you know, even in the most optimistic case of, of um, pulling in hydrogen and electric, the preponderance of the emissions reduction is still expected to come from SAF. That even if we are um, very successful in bringing those, those new technologies into the market, we need a tremendous amount of SAF in order to, to achieve our goals without, the use of, without substantial use of carbon offsets. Where this study assumes we'll need a residual amount to, to cover the, um, the LCA value of fuels not being reaching 100%. Um, but would want, but strategically, we want to minimize our use of carbon offsets as a as a mitigation mechanism for for aviation. And and again, so that the, the primary conclusion is that under all scenarios, we need a lot of SAP. And so, as Boeing, we we put a this is why we've put a big emphasis on saying SAP needs to be our 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 immediate and primary focus. And how do we bring in that that comp, that sustainable aviation fuel supply into the market as soon as possible? because we're gonna need it no matter how technology transpires in the future. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm not sure if I, we got past the slide or if I uh, missed one, but um, apologies. No, that's it, okay, it's fine. Um, and so, you know, that was the ATAG study, but there's been a plethora of other roadmap reports by, by different entities and Boeing's and been a participant in, in some of them. And the, the conclusion of all of them is, is the same, that sustainable aviation fuel is essential. It's a, it's a necessary enabler that we're gonna need a lot of SAF in order to decarbonize aviation. These different studies have different viewpoints on what the, other, what the potential of additional technologies might be, but all of them point to SAF as being a critical component for decarbonizing aviation by 2050. Next slide, please. Ah, that's, so in terms of how much SAF do we need, um, again, using the, the ATAG study um, and the different scenarios, um, we need somewhere between 300 and 450 million tons of SAF. That's a lot. Um, if you know, we're not as successful in bringing these alternative technologies or we're increasing the energy efficiency of aviation, we'll need you know, upwards of 450 million tons, 445. If we're wildly successful, we'll need only 300 million tons or so. Um, but the trajectory Iran doesn't get us anywhere near that. And nobody on this this webinar is going to be surprised by that. Everybody is here is paying attention to that. So fundamentally, what we need to do is change the trajectory. All we got to do is change the trajectory of what of, that we're currently on. So it's one of these trajectories that gets us much closer to the target we need. And to put in context, um, what that that change in pace means is we need to get to one percent of our target, roughly you know ten times our use today by 2025. We need to get to another 10 times improvement by 2030. And then we need to get to another 10 times improvement of that 2030 um, target by 2050. Now the 2030 target of 10%, um, you know, what this curve represents just happens to, to align with what the US government recently uh, said is its own national target for achieving 10% SAP usage by, by 2030. So uh, think of it, you know, three, uh, 10 times, uh, 10, 10 inch bold improvement three times. No small, no small feat um, in order to achieve that. Next slide, please. So one of the key questions though, or the key concerns, if you will, that comes when you, you get into conversation is, well, is that even possible? Um, and so the, I like to say that yes, it's possible, but it, we're, what we're trying to get is from possible to probable. And in the possible realm, one of the, concerns is oftentimes, is there enough feedstock potential? You know, do you have to use so much land to make this untenable? Well, we did the study with the World Economic Forum in the Clean Skies for Tomorrow. Uh, McKinsey led the study, was, was a compilation of existing research out, out there. And this was done back in 2000. Um, and the, the, the key finding to me of that study was that there is enough um, potential supply. 
that if you look at the advanced and waste space streams alone, the study identified up to 490 million tons of potential south. That doesn't take into account um, the, the potential of power to liquids, doesn't take into account the potential of um, sustainable but crop-based fuels. Um, so there, there is the potential of achieve, there's the potential of achieving more than enough supply for aviation needs. But again, we're, we're not uh, close to the point of being probable. And that's what we gotta do. We have to change the trajectory of where we are to, to get to where we need to be. Next slide, please. So in terms of how that's gonna happen, um, there's really four technology pathways that are getting most of the conversation right now. They're not the only ones. Um, we're involved in one pathway that's not part of this. Um, you know, so there'll be other ones, but there's really four pathways and really you know, three or four different classifications of feedstock. First being HEFA. So our, our beloved you know, fats, oils and greases, uh, where all of current SAF is coming from, where the preponderance of the renewable diesel is coming from, the waste oils, fats and lipids. Everybody knows there, that the, the feedstock is, is an inherent limitation there, but it provides the foundational market development. So it's technology that's available, feedstocks that are available. That's, that's where the initial supply of SAP is coming from. The next, next tranche are those cellulosic feedstocks, the waste-based feedstocks, the, the municipal solid waste, forestry, agricultural residuals through both FT and alcohol to jet using gasification for, in both cases for the most part. And that, that's where you get a really large potential supply, but where we are still in the not quite com fully commercialized yet. And I've seen Susan's slides and she's gonna go through the challenges here and I'm looking forward to the discussion on that. And then the long-term where, where there's a lot of discussion right now is around power to liquids. Everybody sees the, the, the potential there. Um, there's, a, there's a tendency to wanna to consider that the potential as being unlimited, but fundamentally the, the power to liquid pathway is limited by the availability of renewable energy. The renewable energy is, is not an unlimited quantity today. The sun may be unlimited, um, but the, the availability of renewable energy from, from wind and solar is, is not itself unlimited. And so that there are other uses for that re resource that will be competing uses for the resources that will affect the cost and the availability of the power to liquid pathway. Not to dismiss its potential, but we, we shouldn't be relying on it. So we, we're taking very much a, a viewpoint here of an all of the above approach. We, what we really want to be doing is driving fuels that are available, affordable, and sustainable. Um, we shouldn't be getting too much prescriptive beyond that. Next slide, please. And so how to accelerate this? Fundamentally, it's all about working together. Um, we need government policies. And you know, as an industry, we're working with the governments to try and find those, those policies to put them in place. Great progress on the blender's tax credit in, in the US. Um, part of that is, is helping to level us with the, the, the road transport incentives. Um, the other aspect besides incentives is the investment capital, both for, the, for new project development and for the R&D to develop new pathway technologies to more economically convert those feedstocks into fuels. And all of this, again, is collaboration amongst all stakeholders, that no one of us can do this well, certainly not an airplane manufacturer or an individual airline or an individual fuel producer. We all need to um, work together. And that is, next slide please, foundational how Boeing has been approaching SAF for, for over a decade since, well before I got involved here. We've long seen this as um, a collaboration opportunity. Um, we've seen this as regionally focused collaboration opportunities, working across stakeholder groups, including the NGO community, to find ways to commercialize SAF in different regions of the world. And so as Boeing, we've been working in many different regions of the world, working in lots of different kinds of projects from policy focused things to um, now um, direct investment into project development. But fundamentally in all of these cases, we need to ensure that sustainability is at the forefront. That sustainability is one of the key criteria. And these fuels have to be sustainable and they have to be accepted as being sustainable for, for aviation to receive the credit for the emissions reduction that comes with them. Next slide, please. So in terms of you know, just a few snippets of, of Boeing specific actions that we're doing in, in that map. One, we've been using SAF as a company going back to 2012. So we, on the, we've used e, uh, sustainable aviation fuel on every eco demonstrator program since 2012. We've now completed eight of them. Actually, we haven't completed the, the eighth one yet. We're actively flying the 737-9 eco demonstrator um, in Alaska Airlines delivery today. 
Um, that airplane has been flying most of its flights, the vast majority of its flights on a 50% blend of SAF. So the maximum that's allowed under the, the current ASTM rules. And so I'll get to on a later slide, also have, have done a flight on 100% SAF. We did a 100% SAF flight on the 777-2018 Eco Demonstrator with FedEx. So SAF has been a key part of these programs, sometimes doing actual technology experiments, um, sometimes more than anything else, just demonstrating our commitment that SAF is important to the industry. And so we're using it where it makes sense for us as a business. Next slide, please. Another recent development for, for Boeing, and I alluded to this a little bit ago, is um, we've um, signed up a partnership with Sky Energy. Um, Sky Energy, as I think most of you know, has been active in the SAF space for, for over a decade. Boeing's had an informal relationship with them for, for a decade. Um, and we've, we're partnering with them in two ways. So first, they've created a subsidiary known as Sky Americas, Sky Energy Americas, that is developing a sustainable aviation fuel facility in the West Coast, most likely in the Pacific Northwest. And they're um, building that on a landfill gas-based pathway. Um, that's a really interesting pathway. Um, new technology, we're interested in supporting that. So we have um, invested directly in that, that project through, uh, through an offtake arrangement. But we're also partnering with, with Sky Energy globally to, to help scale up SAF in different other, in other parts of the world. So really two, two elements to this announcement. And really the first um, time we, or as far as I'm aware, any, any OEM has made a direct investment into a SAF um, production project such as this. Next slide, please. We also, um, early, very early this year, uh, made a commitment to ensuring our airplanes would be 100% SAF capable by 2030. In a practical sense, we don't expect airplanes to be flying on SAF by 2030, um, but we're, what we wanna do is make sure that the airplanes that we're delivering by 2030 um, are compatible with the future of 100% SAF so that when we get to the point where we start to breach that 50% blend limit, that the airplanes are not a constraint. We want, that one of our key, key challenges, key strategies is to remove technical barriers at the airplane level. And this is part of that. Um, we, like all of the OEMs, are on the ASTM Fuels Committee. Um, we are directly participating in the, the, the committee that is developing the 100% SAF specification. Um, but we're also doing the, the internal studies around the airplane itself to, to make sure that there aren't any technical hurdles in making sure that the airplane itself is compatible with the different potential future SAF specifications. Next slide, please. And then um, last thing I wanna highlight, I think, uh, no, second to last thing I wanna highlight is our partnership with RSB, so the Roundtable on Sustainable Biomaterials. We've had a long-term partnership with them. Um, the last couple of years has been Boeing sponsoring a project in Brazil and Africa to look at um, sustainable feedstock potentials for SAF. Um, this is part of an ongoing relationship that, that just to, to emphasize really two aspects that we think are core. One, the importance of strong sustainability criteria and principles as evidenced by the RSB standard. And two, the, to, to demonstrate with data what the real potential is on the feedstock side of the SAF supply side. So Boeing and RSB have, have been, it's been a great successful partnership for us, um, developed a lot of capability and tools that can be replicated in other parts of the world going forward, in addition to the, to the results that they're delivering in the study itself. And then lastly, last slide, please. As part of our recent Eco Demonstrator program, we did some um, emissions testing on SAF blends up to 100% SAF in partnership with NASA. So NASA brought their mobile test lab out um, and measured the emissions of, of the plume it, on, during ground testing of different SAF blends up to 100% SAF. So it's a really interesting set of experiments combining essentially what is the cleanest fuel available, 100% SPK, 100% um, paraffinic fuel, um, with a modern um, LEAP 1B combustor engine, which has very low emissions in and of itself. So cleanest fuel with cleanest combustor. Um, too soon to, to report on data, but we're great um, opportunity to do that testing. Looking forward to seeing the results. And we also took the opportunity to do a, a, a test flight on 100% SAF in one of the engines, um, similar to what we did back in 2018 with the 777. So um, that's my last slide. So thanks for the, the time, Jack. I can answer a couple of questions with the time I haven't used up here, but um, what a rip. I can see a couple here um, in, the, in the chat window already or the Q&A window. 
Yes, yeah, so great job, Sean. I mean, I, I so I again, as I mentioned in my introduction, I think Boeing is very much the champion in the space. So I, I think one of the questions with regard to cost, I think we'll leave to the panel discussion. But two of the questions that come in that are relate, and you covered it in your presentation. You know, why why are we limited to fifty percent blends? So if you want to elaborate, uh, ca captures two of the questions that have come in there. Yeah. So you know, so the, the fifty percent blend limit came about in the original ASTM approvals. Um, going back to 2011 or so. Um, and, and some of it is you know, just making sure that you know, normal safety conservatives and that safety is always the most important thing in, in aircraft. Um, but the, the technical rationale is that there are some properties of, of SPKs in particular that make 100% SPK challenging for the airplane. So the, the two things that um, were the primary thing that people know about and is true is the relationship between the aromatics in conventional jet fuel and the seal material in the fuel systems. That the aromatics pr promote seal swell and keep the, the seals operating um, well throughout, a, throughout its um, lifetime. And so when, if you go to a fuel that has no aromatics in that, you, you have some potential issues there. And so that 50% blend limit is there to address that issue. And I think the other one has to do with density or viscosity. And um, I'm not a chemist, so I will um, defer to others on the, the real answer there. Now, Sean, that sounds great. I, I think what we'll do is leave some of the other questions with regard to cost to the, the panel discussion. Uh, but thank you very much. I mean, I, again, great having you and Boeing here championing the cost. And, and we'll uh, engage you again when we get to the panel discussion. Thanks, Jack. Thanks, Sean. So our uh, next speaker is Steve Sonka. So uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Steve. It's uh, someone who I think has been looking at this area intensely for probably too long, Steve, if that's right. And uh, so, Steve, over to you. Thanks, Jack. Yeah, so, some days it does feel like too long. Um, but no, we keep hammer away at it. And I hope that I'm able to shed some light on the successes that we're having. So, Sean, thanks for establishing a great foundation for the rest of our discussions today. Um, it's, it's worth noting uh, from my perspective that this is a strategy that started to formulate in the 2005, 2006, 2007 timeframe. And, and commensurate with forming that strategy, there was a lot of work done by the industry itself to look at what kinds of abatement approaches that we might have, et cetera. And we clearly settled on SAF rather quickly. And that was predicated on work that had been done back into the 80s about our ability to produce synthetic fuels. So um, thankfully, the industry uh, convened some efforts to go off and work the nuts and bolts of sustainable aviation fuel development. And that's when CAFI was formed. And so CAFI has been at this work since 2006. And we are uh, one of the entities that Sean talked about in terms of these collaborating efforts. We've been out there collaborating with a very broad range of uh, constituents to make these fuels real, to bring them into production, to work on the standards associated with approving them, uh, working on supply chain development, et cetera. Um, and so what you're seeing today is a reflection of uh, 15 years of work I've been at the helm of CAFI since 2012, and uh, the longest I've ever held a single job in my career of 36 years in the aviation industry. Uh, the thing that keeps it new and fresh for me is that every day it's, it's something very different, uh, as well as the fact that I'm bolstered by the progress that we continue to make. Next slide. Um, so on that picture on the title, we've been using fuel in commercial service since March of 2016. So we're at five and a half, uh, five and three quarters years of, of use in commercial service. And uh, it's continuing to build and I'll, and I'll talk a little bit about that. This slide basically is a summary of the series of points that I would make in an elevator speech with respect to, well, how are we doing? Um, and, and, you know, so I have a little bit more content on each of these bullets. But you, you saw uh, from Sean's material, aviation enterprise is fully aligned now uh, across the operators, uh, business aviation, commercial aviation, freight companies, general aviation, et cetera. 
we're approaching, assuming we have a reasonable recovery, we're approaching 100 billion gallon per year marketplace. Um, the challenge that we have as an industry is people want to fly uh, because of the productivity uh, that it provides to, to society. Um, and the challenge there is if we have a three to five percent per year growth rate uh, and we're not introducing technology in, in improvements at that same rate, then our emissions port, um, profile continues to grow. Well, the good news is SAF delivers net greenhouse gas reductions of, and, and I know people quote all over the place on this, and I like to be a little bit more broad than some people. Some folks say 70, 80 percent. Realistically, all the things we're looking at now deliver from 65 to 100 percent reductions in net greenhouse gases, as well as other services uh, that aren't being monetized. But it's also important to know, and you're going to see more and more of this over the next few years, that there are multiple SAF pathways that actually deliver carbon negative fuels or CI reductions greater than 100 percent. So the carbon is being sequestered somewhere else affiliated with the industry's use of renewable resources. And that's important because that aspect, the actual carbon reduction that we'll see from using any gallon of SAF will have an implication on how much SAF we need to, to achieve uh, carbon neutrality or zero carbon in 2050. The good news is segment, our segment, the entire SAF uh, portfolio of players knows how to make it. We've got uh, fuel readiness levels of nine, which means we've got physical fuel in production, and fuel readiness levels of one, which means a scientist somewhere has sketched something on the back of a napkin that the industry is going to go off and explore. And the reason that that's exciting is that the, the pipeline of additional opportunities going forward continues to expand, both in terms of the kinds of feedstocks that can be used, as well as the kinds of conversion processes to take hydro, hydrogen and carbon from one source and translate them into the hydrocarbons that we know and love as jet fuel. CAFI is one of the entities working that, uh, fostering, catalyzation, enabling. And my input to everyone watching from around the world is that every country should be considering something similar. Taking a look at all of this foundation, all the principles that have been laid out and determining how can SAF, the SAF commercialization, take place in your country. And Kathy and others are open to helping people uh, do that kind of work. Physically, we have six facilities online producing SAF around the world. Five of those are from lipids. They are increasing their run rates and they continue to increase their off takers. And in many cases, they're continuing to look at subsequent facilities or upgrades to those facilities to continue to expand production. We are regularly, um, we, we have this uh, progression of commercialization or commercial agreements that I can't keep up with. Uh, another large one was announced this morning between One World and primarily their partner or, or one of their members, American Airlines, with a Metis Corporation in California to take nearly the entire production slate from that facility. And those are going to continue to roll out. I'll give you a little bit of reflection for that in a couple of slides. The industry continues to remove barriers. So Sean talked about 50% synthetic uh, fuel production or fuel blending limit. A uh, couple of questions were asked in QA. In fact, this morning we had a meeting of the 100% SAF task force and we're making nice progress there in terms of uh, identifying the structure by which we'll be able to move in the direction of 100% SAFs. And that will happen in a couple ways. There isn't just one way to make that happen, it'll happen in several ways. And we'll do that and still not impact the, the legacy fleet that's out there that still does need some level of uh, cycloparaffinic or aromatic content uh, to maintain the certification basis of those aircraft. There does need to be, with all of that progress, there continues need to need to be the uh, appropriate conversion processes for targeted feedstocks, primarily to address the key issue that we have at this point, which is enabling affordability. Next slide. 
So a few comments on, on different things. And again, this is the next layer. For those of you who have been immersed in this space, uh, a couple of these slides are you know, really fundamental, but for those of you who haven't been, I've got these included in here uh, to provide some additional perspective. Um, so why SAF? Well, we talked about the, our emissions growth profile with respect to technology incorporation and our need to bring down the carbon curve for industry. And SAF is available to start doing that today. And in fact, we've been doing that for five years. It does deliver significant net carbon reductions as a drop-in fuel, mitigating the amount of societal investment that's needed. We don't need to completely change out our infrastructure. We don't need to rebuild every airport in the world. We don't need to introduce a new fleet of 20 some thousand aircraft that burn a fuel other than jet fuel. Um, SAF usage can grow quickly when it's enabled by policy. So policy in those cases is used either as a mandate or an incentive to close a price gap that might exist between SAF and petroleum jet fuel. In the US, we're looking more at the um, incentive approach and we'll likely see more on the mandate side in the EU with blending mandates uh, coming into vogue over the next couple of years. Progress continues to be made across all of the remaining technical barriers that we have. And it's important to recognize that SAF commercialization can take place worldwide Commensurate with the feedstocks that are available in those regions. And we're clearly going to need that approach in order to achieve those 2050 targets. We need fuel production to occur everywhere. Next slide. So, again, more fundamentals. We talk about SAF. Specifically, what are we talking about? Sustainable aviation fuel. So, focus on the middle word first aviation fuel. We're talking about being able to produce jet fuel from hydrocarbon sources other than petroleum. So this enables a drop in approach, no changes to infrastructure, equipment, et cetera. First word, sustainable. Doing so while taking social, economic, and environmental progress into account, especially being focused on the greenhouse gas reduction uh, component of things. You say, well, how do we do that? The, the way that we do that is rather simple all tied up in chemistry, but we create synthetic jet fuel molecules using biochemical and thermochemical processes to convert those carbon molecules into jet fuel. So essentially at the end of the day, SAF is a synthetic fuel comprised of molecules that are essentially identical to petroleum-based jet fuel, either in whole or in part. And that last parenthetical gets at, at this issue of all right, well, how much of those can I use? Can I only use them in a, in a partial blend, a 50% blend, or up to 100%? And we're making progress there. Unabashedly, this is the third time I've mentioned this, this approach of using SAF as our primary uh, carbon uh, abater uh, is the lowest societal impact way to decarbonize civil aviation. Next slide. So here very specifically, is a couple of more tangible examples other than just the words. On the left-hand side of the screen, you have uh, today's scenario and what society is grappling with, right? We continue to reach into the ground and pull hydrocarbon molecules out of the ground in the form of petroleum or other petro uh, sources. We are able to convert those to jet fuel. When we burn those, the CO2 is released into the atmosphere. And in that scenario, we continue to build up atmospheric carbon dioxide. On the sustainable aviation side in the middle, instead of reaching into the ground to access those hydrocarbons, we're taking them from uh, feedstocks that are themselves pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere. And there's a whole range of those feedstocks that we'll talk a little bit more about. Fat, fats, oils, and greases, lignocellulose, starches, and sugars, and a bunch of waste streams from a circular economy production kinds of scenarios. So we're able to pull atmospheric CO2 or CO2 that's already in our bio or carbon that's already in our biosphere, convert that to jet fuel. So the result 
is a net reduction of additional greenhouse gases being introduced into our biosphere, which is what we're after. Next page. So the specifics on the left-hand side is a list. And this list is actually rather old. I think this came from work that was done in 2009, 2010. Uh, but the number of pathways and feedstocks that people have done net LCA greenhouse gas work is extremely long and continues to grow. But here's just a sample of the different ways to produce uh, SAF from different feedstock sources. And so you can see that most of what's coming into the marketplace right now is uh, HEFA, SPK, hydroprocessed esters and fatty acids, or SAF that's coming from fats, oils, and greases. And a couple of examples there that can come from technical tallow from animal processing. It can come from used cooking oil of oil that we use as humans that's discarded uh, and a bunch of other different ways. And so you can see in those examples, based on how this analysis was done, that those pathways give us a net reduction of between 65 and 78 percent of of carbon index reduction versus the uh, petroleum baseline level that's widely established at 89 grams of CO2 equivalent per megajoule. So I talked about the pathways that we're looking at of above 65%. Part of the reason for that is policy uh, happens to reward or focus on solutions that are giving significant reductions, in most cases, more than 50%. There's a lot of solutions out there in the 60 to 80% range. And I'll repeat that there are some solutions now that people are starting their commercialization activity to deliver fuel that achieves greater than 100% through carbon sequestration or other emissions reductions. Next page. And that's a slow build. All right, so those are some fundamentals. Uh, how are we doing technically? Well, SAF are becoming increasingly technical viable. We now know we can utilize numerous pathways. We've got seven approved already. There are six more in process. We might be lucky enough to see three additions in 2022. We'll see how that goes. And there are several more beyond that with the six that are in process, as well as by my count in the companies that I'm working with, at least another 15 that are out there enabling use of all the feedstocks that I talked about before, those thermochemical and biochemical processes. The beauty of it is, of the, of the structure that we have set up, is I create this synthetic component. I perhaps blend it with jet fuel. In the future, I might not need to blend it with jet fuel. I may be able to use it as is. I may be able to use it if it's blended with another uh, SAF blending component. And following that, it is completely indistinguishable from petroleum jet fuel. And we still need, we still have messaging work to do or communications work to do because there are some people in the world who their concept of renewable fuels is limited to ethanol for gasoline and biodiesel for diesel. And those are not drop in fuels necessarily. And so we have some people who think about the concept of a, of a, uh, a renewable jet fuel as being uh, deficient in characteristics versus jet fuel, and that's not the case. Sean mentioned the fact before that in many cases, the actual attributes of that synthetic fuel are better than the jet fuel, the hydrocarbon jet fuel, or the petroleum jet fuel that we've been using. So future pathways are gonna be able to uh, have blending components that need less or zero blending. I think that's physically gonna happen within a couple of years, well before we need to worry about saturating the marketplace uh, and, and having to bust down a blend wall. I think the industry is gonna have that uh, architecture in place that'll to allow that to occur. Another thing that's, that's happening that I'm encouraged by, and there's different views on this, but that is the uh, exploration of renewable crude co-processing with refineries. The benefit there is uh, the fact that we can produce SAF in existing refineries through co-processing and other methodologies. And the size of the capital expense or the capital investment that needs to be made can be lowered significantly. And that's a hurdle for the industry. So 
um, you see more and more now of the major petroleum companies recognizing societal demand to lower carbon with fuels, and there are different ways that they can play in this space, and that's encouraging to me to see them involved. Um, we're continuing to take uh, time and impact out of the process to, as we go along, to continue to be able to look at more and more, less cost, less time, bring multiple opportunities uh, to, to bear. Challenge does, at present, continue to be focused on being able to produce these at a reasonable cost, even with uh, oil at $50, $60, $70 a barrel. It's, it's still a challenge. Next page. So we're focused on cost, right? What can you do to continue to reduce cost? I can lower the capital expense associated with production, like I just talked about, by retrofitting refineries or using co-processing. I can lower the OPEX of producing these fuels by perhaps using more plentiful or 24-7 types of waste streams. And I'll talk a little bit more specifically about what those some of those waste streams look like. I can do the engineering integration on the back with respect to energy management in these systems, bring down costs there, or improve efficiencies. I can find value from production slipstreams off of these SAF production concepts and sell those into the marketplace. A good example of that is Amherst. Amherst started off quite a few years ago looking at the sustainable aviation fuel marketplace as key for one of the technologies that they've developed. They have since found that, that cosmetics and pharmaceuticals is a much higher uh, profit uh, potential, and that's where the majority of their synthetic components have gone. Uh, but that's not to say that as they grow out to be a, a very big market player, that they don't subsequently have the opportunity to come back into our space and, as those other markets get saturated. And so everyone we're working with, we encourage them to be thinking about whether there are product streams that can be used for other purposes. That's even the case with this most fundamental uh, scenario of producing hydroprocessed esters and fatty acids. There are some components that are mixed in with that uh, total output that are uh, of a little bit higher value. And if that can augment the economics, then so be it. Capturing value from other environmental services, uh, sometimes we're able to do that, like if we use landfill recovery gas, that, which itself is a potent, very potent greenhouse gas. Um, you know, there's some, there is some potentially some um, policy uh, support that goes along with utilizing landfill recovery gas. But there are actually quite a few examples, even if you go into purpose grown feedstocks and your ability to sequester carbon in the soil to address water quality issues, et cetera. Next slide. So Sean mentioned this briefly uh, with respect to the Waypoint study. Uh, and I threw this in there because I see a little bit too much hand wringing around the world with respect to, well, how do we produce these things? And is there enough feedstocks and you know, X, Y, Z uh, hand wringing? And I think you know, Sean had an example of very significant amount of resources that are out there. Um, there's, here's a little bit more fidelity with respect to some of the work that went into that in a specific case of how much fuel you can get from municipal solid waste, from forestry residues, wood processing waste, ag, ag residues, waste food production, industrial off gases, and oil and cellulosic crops, uh, with the long term potential of being able to move to power to liquids. And CAFI has had done this work uh, several years ago, and we also know that those six primary waste streams can produce at least 60% of the jet fuel uh, demand in North America, if not more than that, depending on the assumptions that you use without ever looking at a purpose-grown crop. Next page. So there is a little bit of limitation that people have with respect to fats, oils, and greases. And I understand that. And what a lot of people get hung up on is just looking at wh where are you today and not thinking a little bit more broadly. And so one of CAFI's roles is to think a little bit more broadly. And so I'll challenge anyone to put on that same hat with respect to any process or feedstock that you're looking at. 
we are a nascent industry. We've only been at this a little in detail more than a little bit more than a decade. Bear with us as we continue to do a lot of things that enable those uh, production of 330 to 450 million metric tons by 2050. The case of fat soils and greases, what can I do today? I can expand the availability of what I have today in terms of waste lipids, tallow, white grease, chicken fat. I can make sure that I'm capturing all those things. Brown grease is not utilized. It's being landfilled today. So there are some folks commercializing around the concept of being able to utilize brown grease. There's industrial effluents out there that have a lot of lipid content. And then I ex can expand existing oilseed and row crop production. So several expansion scenarios. So, and, and then there's also uh, an additional family of approaches to produce lipids that do require some additional research and development, demonstration and deployment. And that's around new oil seeds and row crops that don't compete for land use. Tree and bush oils, algae, both micro and macro, advanced microbial conversion of lignocellulose, right? This is very low on the radar of a lot of people, but there are methodologies where I break down lignocellulose and in producing lipids and fatty acids from that that can go into HEFA processes. And then some very fascinating work with respect to what ARPA has done on the ability for plants to actually excrete oil or excress oil in the biomass itself. So the same way today that you bring in a sugar cane plant and crush it and pull off a sugar syrup for food production, you may be able tomorrow to do that with a tobacco or a hemp plant and, and have the same kind of process. So again, um, when I see people hand wringing on feedstocks, I say, you don't have a lot to worry about and there's a lot of options to produce those sustainable, su sustainably and come work with us on those definitions. Next slide. And as usual, I know I'm bad on time. So I'm going to whiz through these uh, last few uh, a little bit more aggressively. Uh, we're making progress, focuses on commercial availability or viability. I talked before about things that government can do to help that in terms of policy. Next slide. Um, where are we on US SAF con uh, consumption? This is not a perfect metric. Uh, we're pulling data here from EPA site. And so there is some fuel that's coming into the country that's not reflected in these numbers, but you can see the buildup in SAF that's occurred since 2016. And through the end of October, we were sitting at about 4.3 uh, million gallons uh, of, of usage in the US. Next slide. Um, where are we headed? Uh, we've got a goal now in the U.S. to produce about 10% of our capacity by 2030. Uh, here's a handful of companies that are working in this space and some of the production volumes above the, the x-axis that we can see getting to about 900 plus million gallons in 2026. And what this doesn't reflect is the fact that there are a lot of entities that we're working with behind the scenes, in addition to the ones on this slide here that you may have heard a little bit about, but there's an additional 40 entities who we're collaborating with on being able to bring uh, production capacity online. So I'm actually feeling good about being able to achieve the 10% goal in the 2030 timeframe. Next slide. Uh, worldwide, I said before, you know, it's impossible to keep up with this. I think IATA tries to do that too. Uh, we can clearly have, we clearly have line of sight to being able to achieve 3% of supply in five years and continuing to double that in, in out years. Again, future looks bright. Here's just a handful of the, the folks that are out there over the next, that we should see production coming from in the next five years. Next slide. So where are we going? Uh, we're moving forward. We're continuing research and development and demonstration and deployment. We've got a strong uh, additional several years of partnership outlined here in the US. Again, I continue to, to encourage uh, folks in other countries to do this. Uh, we're getting support of policy, whether it's an incentive or a mandate, they are gonna move this market forward. Customers are engaging. Uh, the next uh, talk up is, is from Jeff. Jeff's going to talk to you about uh, different commercial models that might be used to help us move forward. We're removing technical barriers. Petroleum companies are coming in and, 
and production is increasing. Commercial agreements are being announced almost on a weekly basis now. We also have the opportunity, I didn't talk about this at all, uh, but to repurpose or improve Gen 1 fuels, including ethanol, biodiesel, and renewable diesel production that's significant here in the US as an example. And hydrogen advancements bode well, not from the perspective of hydrogen powered aircraft, but we need hydrogen for the production of SAF. It's a, it's a clear requirement. Uh, I personally think that a hydrocarbon fuel carrier is, is clearly superior to a hydrogen one, but we're not downplaying the, the benefit of the work that's being done on SAF. Um, and it opens the door to PDL fuels in the future. Next page. And that's it, that's my contact information. My apologies, Jack, for going a couple minutes over, um, but if you wanna take questions now, that's fine. Otherwise, I'll wait till the panel. Great job, Steve. I mean, as usual, lots of uh, information there. So I, I think, uh, you know, there's some questions coming in with the, we might use to move to the panel discussion. But one quick question for me, Steve, because if I look at the US just now, I mean, I, I very much consider places like California is, uh, is the pioneer because you, you've got the policy there, you've got world energy, you've got LEX in terms of uh, the hydrant system. So it, from a US perspective, I tend to look at say Los Angeles airport, that whole uh, hub, where's the next hub in the US if it's, if it's uh, it, outside of it, California? It, yeah, it already exists and that's San Francisco, which is where Sean and I are at today. And San Francisco has been at the forefront of uh, developments and working with the state on low carbon fuel standard criteria, et cetera. Um, so yeah, there's no question. The low carbon fuel standard that exists as a, as a policy measure in California is a large draw. So at today's carbon pricing, it's responsible for something on the order of $1.35 plus per gallon as an incentive for production. And so yes, right now, the map in the US is quite tilted toward the, to, to the uh, West Coast. Uh, with fuel standards in California and Oregon and, and the framework being adopted recently in Washington, uh, potentially what's going on in BC too. So um, that'll be a huge draw for fuel and it's effective. I can tell you that there's in excess of 10 billion gallons of renewable diesel capacity being planned in the US. Uh, all of that capacity uh, a portion of that can be directed at SAF if the policy level playing field is level. And Sean made, men, made mention of that before. That's what we as an industry are trying to do with the blenders tax credit and producers tax credit. And so when that occurs, I think it automatically flips the switch for some of those producers to take that 10 billion gallons of planned capacity and see a lot of that shift to the California market we have to recognize that the combined California renewable diesel and or the diesel and jet market is only about eight and a, eight, oh, almost nine billion gallons. Um, so there's limited limits there. Um, so what we're seeing is other states in the region or other states in the U.S. are also looking at low carbon fuel standards. Uh, one of the Congress women in the U.S. has proposed a national low carbon fuel standard as an example. So again, early days, we're just getting started, right? So um, let's let policy play out. Let's let states who don't understand the economic implications of being able to produce these fuels in their states. They don't understand what the potential um, rural development opportunity is in these states. Let's get that messaging out and we're gonna see pockets of activity across the US and likely very much policy that's more uniform across the US. Thanks, Steve. I think we'll probably revisit that in the, the panel discussion. So I will uh, see you on, at the panel discussion. Thanks again, Steve, great. So uh, our next speaker, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Jeff Levet. So I think anybody who's monitoring things, why, why this area is very important to us in Canada, I'm based here in Vancouver. So in Vancouver for May, June, we had uh, 40 degree temperatures, we had what's called a heat dome. And currently we're now dealing with an atmospheric river. We usually get lots of rain in, in Vancouver, but we've had an incredible amount of rain. So I think we've got climate change in action. So I think uh, what Jeff is gonna describe, describe is we're a big country where we do a lot of flying. 
So I think uh, Jeff has been the champion in terms of putting together CSAF. So Jeff, thanks for uh, describing what CSAF is and how we're going to uh, decarbonize aviation in Canada. Thanks, Jack. Um, I think what's exciting here is um, after following uh, Sean and, and Steve's um, talk here, I, I guess I, all I can say is I'm, I'm listening to Steve. <laughs> We, you know, what we're going to go over today, I think, is is, is a prototype, um, and Kathy has been sort of a model that that we've explored and go a, a bit into um, what I I think are opportunities in Canada for for deploying SAF, but certainly we we are using lessons learned that we've seen elsewhere. Uh, you know, Kathy and Boeing certainly help, and uh, you know, Susan and, and Jack participating in some of the activities that we've done over the years here in terms of uh, looking how to uh, to bring staff into Canada. And I guess my my background is, um, I, I I I also am from commercial aviation until uh, recently, and uh, I was uh, lucky enough to uh, be I think at the forefront in terms of uh, aviation climate policy. I've been in the world of aviation fuel throughout their career. And I was, I was one of the first, I think, to integrate both fuel procurement and uh, environmental sustainability at the aviation level and bring sort of a, a, a one broad view on, on both departments. As I'd like to say, you know, who, who better to explain the fuel emissions than the people who, who buy it and, and put it in the plane. So, so bring a, a unique uh, perspective, I think, in terms of um, um, looking at SAF and really, you know, spent a lot of time in my career looking at the infrastructure and the supply chain and logistics and the handling and the, the safety aspects of fuel, getting it onto the, the, the airport level, and as, as well as uh, the commercial aspects of, of purchasing and, and, and putting in place. And uh, we'll go over uh, how we see sort of our model of being a, a little different, a tweak, I think, a specialty for, for, for what we did in Canada, but uh, let's go over that. Uh, next slide, please. So again, I'll just give you a little bit of context of how we came to, to put this Canadian Council of Sustainable Aviation in place, a little bit of the origin story, and then we'll, we'll talk about, you know, where is the staff in Canada. Next slide. So this is just to, to give you a, a general context, and I think Sean and, and, and Steve have done a great job at sort of placing the, you know, the, 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 the landscape of, of where aviation is, is, is heading towards. Um, but if we if we bring it back down, and, and I guess we'll approach this as a, a case study in terms of, uh, as Steve mentioned, you know, how can we set up uh, collaboration? And, and I think that the main theme is here is, is, is working together. It seems to be the best way and best approach in order to, to ensure that SAF is advanced in, in, in your particular region. So in this case in Canada, what we do know is like we're sitting on an abundance of pretty, um, pretty good volumes of sustainable feedstock. We identified some of those and we'll show you a little bit more what that looks like, you know, but what we do see, of course, is just a fragmented approach to SAF development. There's just no, there's no one body, if you will, collaborate or, or coordinating some of the activities. We see a lot of pockets of, of, of uh, innovation across the country. And of course, that, that slows down if, if people aren't sharing information in, in, in a good way. Um, we, we do have a framework of, of climate policies in, in, in Canada. Um, and, and the SAF piece is, is still missing to a point and requires further discussion with industry. And of course, as you, as you heard, we're, we're seeing competition from, from other jurisdictions, and that certainly needs to be reflected in how we think about how we put our, our uh, policies in place to support SAF. And, and also, we, we also need to consider, of course, how uh, our, our airline or, or aviation regulation and, and policies exist and, and are very different from, from other jurisdictions. And I think that really drives the need for, for industry to talk to government. And of course, it needs to be eco economically viable. Yes, we need to travel more sustainably. SAF, as we saw, is, is just essential for, for aviation to get to net zero. And if we don't have SAF in Canada, we, we think you know our aviation sector is gonna suffer from a competitive perspective. So we need to work together. And this is why we created the Canadian Council of Sustainable Aviation Fuels. Next slide, please. And really, our vision as a council is to bring together the stakeholders, but to, to be uh, developing our strategy and roadmaps in order to initiate the deployment of, of SAF. It really is to become that voice uh, and develop and design the policies in order to facilitate the production and deployment of SAF. And really, you know, become that go-to place for, for, for people to go to, to, to help and to foster 
the relationships and the collaboration that are needed to, to, to put in place some of the, the initiatives to, to advance the, the use of staff. And of course, you know, it needs to be, we, we think our, our, we have a, a pretty good business case for producing it here in Canada so that it's affordable, it's low carbon, low carbon and, uh, you know, sustainable for, for the, the time being. I, I, I have also, we, I participate in an organization called the Energy Futures Lab of Alberta, where we're concerned with the transition of the energy system in an equitable way, uh, you know, towards what the future requires of us. And I, I look at aviation and this biojet and creating this market in the same way. We really need to take a systems look at, at some of the, um, how, how this market can be created. You know, we can't, we can't do it all by ourselves. We can't do it without considering the impacts of, of how other systems are transitioning. Uh, so it, it's, it's, it's incumbent upon us to sort of bring those thoughts together and, and and come up with strategies in order to uh, to deal with those issues. Next slide, please. So, so just just quickly, I mean, this thing came together. You've heard Steve. I mean, I, I've known Steve for several years. So, so just seeing what Kathy has done, uh, we had a, a a research and development org called Garden, which unfortunately um, wasn't able to to obtain for the financing. But you know, they had started. Uh, the process around identifying some of the needs that 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 Canada required to to advance SAF fuel, and one of them was to sort of a you know bring the ecosystem together. I I I, I was more available. Uh, I my new organization uh, works with the airlines on on many fronts, uh, specifically with some of the infrastructure and and supply issues in, in Canada. Um, so brings a unique view, as I said, in terms of how to sort of deploy SAF. And one of the key elements here, I think, is just the, the finance required, obviously, to sustain this organization. And, and uh, we have, uh, we're lucky here in, in North America, but in Canada as well, to have airline fuel consortiums <clears throat> who, who are responsible for um, operating the fueling infrastructure at the airports. And they agreed to sponsor us as an organization. That's how this, this organization was created. Uh, so industry-led. Next slide, please. And just, again, a quick word on the consortia. We think this is where a little bit of a different model than, than what we see elsewhere, but we do have an opportunity through this organization. It represents over 70 plus airlines who operate at, at the 10 major airports. Probably 90, 95% of the fuel uh, flows through the, the, the facilities that this, these groups own and operate. And, and therefore it, it's already uh, two key elements, I think of the value chain and represent, um, they already work together and, and they've been working together as a group, solving these industry challenges around fuel supply for a very long time. So we wanted to use that power and bring that and expand that to expand uh, to, to catalyze sort of the, the SAF ecosystem. Next slide, please. Which of course uh, represents all these, these different factions. I think what's key here is, is like, we're really looking at expanding the, the, the normal sort of value chain around the fuel procurement. An airline purchases fuel in the past, you would deal with your supplier, maybe a logistics agent in order to get your fuel to the airport, maybe the airport owns the fueling infrastructure. And now, now we're forced to sort of understand different aspects of the value chain when it comes to SAF. And it, it really, you know, I, in the past, I've attended conferences, you go to forestry and agriculture conferences, just, you know, the key is, I think, understanding the challenges and barriers and opportunities across the, the value chain. And I think that's where the power of the ecosystem comes in. And similar to CAFI, CSAF's uh, objective is to bring that ecosystem together so that we, we do have that sharing and collaboration of information in order to sort of remove those barriers to, to advance uh, some of these initiatives a little bit more quickly. Next slide, please. So if we overview what, what Canada's opportunities are, we, you know, I, I tried to sort of map out this is my, my, my version of things. Obviously there's, there's very detailed information in, in other specific organizations, but we are really abundant in terms of sustainable feedstock, forestry, uh, on the agriculture, the residual sides. So we have great opportunities to sort of utilize uh, uh, the, these feedstocks in order to produce renewable products. Um, you know, typically uh, diesel or renewable diesel is target, but obviously these, these could be used for SAF. We have great renewable energy sources as well. Several provinces are, are, are most of their energy is, is, is produced by hydroelectricity. We have huge wind capacity. Um, and so, so from a, a feedstock and, and an opportunity perspective, Canada has some, some, some great uh, uh, key strengths to, to work off of. We've had a few SAP potentials come and as, as we go along, like I said, it's been very fragmented as we approach this. 
uh, you know, uh, government uh, um, financed uh, challenges around SAF. Those are the, the, the four red marks we see there. Uh, you know, finalists, there's four finalists. I think they're, they're announcing a winner, uh, $5 million in the next uh, few months. Uh, we have several provinces chasing hydrogen strategies, you know, with hydroelectric and some of the geology in, in Alberta, where it, it's very, very good and, and world class in terms of carbon storage. So all these things are, are needed to produce SAF. So we just need someone to bring it all together with the academia and the refining sector and, and some of the net zero goals. We think there's a great opportunity. And that's where, again, CSAF is, is, is going to spend its time is, is coordinating and collating this, this ecosystem. Next slide, please. So, so from a, a, as we heard before, you know, policies are very are, are, are very important in order to, to help uh, this business out. Uh, Canada does have, uh, a, a, I think, a, a framework of, of climate related uh, programs and policies that would support uh, aviation's need in SAF. Uh, in both cases, we have a, a carbon pricing uh, framework in place. Uh, which is, is, is forecast, well, is, is planned to go to $170 a ton by 2030. We also have uh, a Canadian standard. We're a little luckier in that we, can, we have uh, a national sort of ability to put uh, uh, mandates in place as well, but um, a clean fuel standard, um, which is addressing the carbon intensity and lowering the carbon intensity of the fuels. It is primarily targeted for, for ground fuels. We heard you know, we need to be competitive uh, in, in, uh, for SAF uh, related to ground fuels. And I think that's a, a big challenge uh, that, that we're seeing, even with this framework, is that the main focus seems to be around building uh, efficiency, the, the efficiency of buildings and the energy use there, and, and of course, ground fuels, which from a, from a perspective is, is the highest percentage of emissions. But the problem is, you know, SAF, we need, we need to ensure that we get a little piece of the pie and that we're able to build our market as you saw some of the graphs that, you know, if we were to achieve net zero, we need large volumes of stuff in the future. So we need to start building it now so that we're ready for, for when we get there. <clears throat> um, there are other further complications, I think that we need to consider when we look at the policies and those are related to, you know, as, as you know, the ICAO, the international policies that we're seeing versus some of the domestic policies, we would hope that they were harmonized because you know, the more SAF that can be produced and sold to both international and domestic, obviously that creates more demand. Uh, and then of course, you know, we, we need to consider what aviation's regulatory environment looks like and plan to see how we can uh, creatively come up with whether it's a, a stackable series of programs and policies, but essentially we are competing against the US and some of the European, and we'd hate to see all our biomass and fuel leave the, the country without an opportunity for the Canadian aviation sector to get a little piece of it. Next slide, please. So as we said, government's role, I think is, is essential in this, in this case. Uh, we, you know, we really, we need to look at all the things I just said, that, you know, how can we make policies and programs to incent and, and, and advance uh, uh, the, the biojet in a way that's economically viable over the long term? We need to consider the competitiveness of the other jurisdictions, but really, at the same time, look at how our aviation system is, is, is different and, and uh, compared to those other jurisdictions, as well as the, the unique competitive uh, aspect of, of the, the, the airline business itself and how you know, domestic and, and international businesses compete in the space. Continue on with the progress, we would definitely you know, be supportive of, of more programs available. And, and this is the point again of CSAF is to, to sort of create that platform for industry to work with the government to be able to, again, establish with the barriers, uh, talk about the opportunities and come up with those programs that can help uh, a SAF deployment. Next slide, please. So there we go, there's, there's CSAF. CSAF was, was formed, we actually, so industry led, we launched it in, in August and we've been in the process of setting it up. We are actually actively um, talking to, you know, some key sort of stakeholders uh, to, to become the, the, the launch members of this. Uh, so we have the airlines, we have uh, most of the fueling infrastructure we're talking to, as, as we saw here, airports, uh, the, the major oil suppliers, which are gonna be very important in terms of helping us ensure that, that we, we deploy this stuff. The technology providers, the feedstock providers, again, you know, uh, oil seed providers, to the residuals, to the forest, to the cellulosic, there, there's plenty out there and we need to be able to, to get their views and, and help us, like the governor, the, the, uh, the universities and the government, of course, um, 
you know, we, we need them to, to participate along with us to become more aware of our challenges and barriers. But really the idea here is, you know, CSAT becomes that voice, it becomes the go-to place for, for, for deployment and, and that we have a way for this network to at least uh, start talking to others so that we can look at how we can advance stuff. Next slide, please. So once we get set up, I think our, our next step is really to nail down what our, our strategy is for Canada, knowing everything that we've showed here today, develop those roadmaps, whether it be through um, some, some target setting or some, some backward or uh, backcasting so we can discover what those, those key elements of the action plan look like. And again, different regions in Canada um, have different opportunities. And I think it's really incumbent upon us to sort of, as, as much as you know, this is a national strategy, a lot of the regional opportunities are gonna be felt more at the provincial level. So it's very important that we engage both levels of government in, in, in this case. And, and certainly that, that is within the plan. So really by uh, the early next year, what we hope to have in place is our strategy, is our roadmap and an action plan to move forward uh, with the initiatives. And that will also drive uh, our engagement and advocacy plan that we can start chatting a little bit more in detail with the government in terms of how we're gonna approach and design some of these SAP programs that are needed to, uh, to, to help Canada move forward. Next slide, please. So all to say, as I said, CSAF is, is gonna be that place. We're in, we're in process of, of finalizing the setup. Um, again, our goal is to, to, to convene this, this, the, the, the ecosystem together, to get everyone sort of pointed in the right direction and hopefully uh, come to terms and align on changing that policy regime in order to, to support SAF to be manufactured here, to be used here. And of course, if uh, we'll, we'll send it everywhere else too, if it, if it makes good business sense. So thank you very much. Um, I made up some of the time, Jack, uh, hopefully that's okay. And um, we can chat questions now or later. And, and thanks thanks again for allowing me to, uh, to present the, our idea here. Well, thanks, Jeff. It, it's uh, again, great way to kind of profile what we're hoping to aspire to in Canada. There's one specific question with CSAF that's come in. So, I'll pose that to you just now and use the other questions with the panel. So what's coming in is, is uh, you know, the, does, do you see CSAF having a role with regard to certification? So if there's a technology just now, are you, are you advocate, will you facilitate to CSAF help uh, with certification of future uh, SAF biojet fuels? Yeah, and, and, and um, <clears throat> we, we haven't sort of discovered what or determined what those, those future plans are, but I think one of our main goals is really to facilitate know the environment so that everyone can can either produce or access so if there is a need to I, I'm not saying I, I don't think we're, we're going to be in the business of, of um, advocating for for one technology or another but certainly if, if there are barriers that industry needs to tear down in order to to make that easier that that is something we would uh, pursue and, and work together on Thanks, Jeff. I think we we'll might revisit that topic in the, the panel discussion so our, our Thanks, last Jack. presenter is uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Susan Van Dyke. Susan, if you've noticed, has been the main author on a couple of uh, what I think are very pivotal reports from IA Bioenergy for IRENA and other organizations. So I think, uh, I know Susan could talk for a couple of days on this topic, but uh, Susan, over to you, uh, as I, I know this is gonna be an enlightening presentation. I look forward to it. Thanks, Jack. And uh, thank you for the invitation to speak here today. Um, so I'm going to speak about uh, the really mostly technologies uh, based on our report that we published earlier this year. Next slide. So this report is available on the IEA website and we also had a, a, a webinar in July that uh, you can revisit if you are interested. Um, and I'm going to speak a lot about the technologies aspects that is covered in the report, but I've also added some, some other aspects. Uh, next slide. And a lot of this work is built on previous reports uh, published by IEA Bioenergy Task 39 uh, on drop-in biofuels uh, published in 2014, 2019. And the third one on the right is still currently in progress. It has not been published yet, but hopefully uh, we'll get that out soon. Next slide. So the, the key take home messages from my talk is, is really, when it comes to technology, there's no silver bullet and 
that all SAF technologies should be commercialized um, uh, uh, and that the large price gap with conventional jet fuel is the biggest challenge for expansion. Uh, in this uh, regard, the right combination of policies will probably be the most important driver of expansion. Currently, HEFA supplies most of the SAF and will continue to be the biggest supplier of SAF up to 2030, in our opinion. Um, the first fully commercial facilities for other technologies, such as gasification, fissure crops, alcohol to jet, will probably lead to rapid expansion as more facilities follow, and that will uh, pave the way for cost reduction as we're moving from Pioneer to end facilities. Power to liquids will play an important role, but probably only significant after 2030 and 2040. Um, Pyrolysis HTL technology pathways have great potential, but will probably only become significant after 2030. And I think the last point, uh, one of the technology pathways that are perhaps sometimes overlooked is SAF production through co-processing. And I'll be looking at some of these technologies, but first I'm going to look at some of the, the policy aspects and uh, around price. Next slide. So the price of SAF is considered the biggest obstacle to airlines. Um, and HEFA SAF in July was uh, priced by August Media uh, as between $2,000 and $2,300 per ton. Um, and in November, this had gone up to $2,900 per ton compared with conventional jet fuel at $700 per ton. And bridging this price gap essential is essential because it, it's uh, difficult for airlines to compete on this basis. And policy, we think, is the most critical factor in this process. Next slide. So if we look at not just the, the price, but the production cost uh, and prospects for price parity, uh, we see that SAF will potentially always be more expensive to produce, uh, although significant cost reductions will take place over time as we move from Pioneer to end facilities. And of course, it also relies on the price of oil. Um, and Pioneer facilities are estimated to be about 50% more expensive to, to construct. And when we look at some recent reports that have been published for uh, cost reduction potential, the World Economic Forum Clean Skies for Tomorrow report, and the ICF report that forms part of the ATAG waypoint to 2050, and this graph is taken from the ICF report that really shows uh, progressive improvement or reduction in capital costs for technologies. And as you will see the, at the bottom, the HEFA process, there's not much opportunity for, for CAPEX uh, reduction. So look at these reports if, if you want more detailed analysis of, of cost reductions. Uh, next slide. So in our opinion, SAF specific policies will have the greatest uh, impact on SAF expansion. And the, um, Steve already spoke about the California low carbon fuel standard, which included aviation in 2018 already on an opt-in basis. Um, then we've seen mandates and proposed mandates in Norway, Sweden, Finland. And of course the uh, proposed refuel EU mandate uh, is a very, very significant step in terms of policy uh, to create structural demand for, for SAF. And they also propose to include a dedicated uh, e-kerosene uh, mandate. And then uh, in the US, the proposed Sustainable Skies Act and the Blenders tax credit um, is very, very significant in terms of driving uh, the expansion of, of SAF production. Next slide. What we've also seen, and I think is, is quite significant, is the issue of voluntary corporate actions and the role that book and claim this process will, will uh, uh, play in creating demand for SAF outside of official policy. So some of these voluntary actions uh, organizations such as Board Now formed by Sky Energy, but very significantly earlier this year, the Sustainable Aviation Buyers Alliance was launched. The official launch took, launch took place at the COP26. Um, and 
this could create a very strong demand signal, which is irrespective of the national policies. So basically the founding companies of SABA were uh, companies such as Netflix, uh, Microsoft, JP Morgan, Boston Consulting Group, uh, etc. cetera. And uh, so because these companies want to reduce uh, the scope three emissions, which involves flying, uh, uh, they want to purchase the sustainability uh, of SAF without being direct users of the fuel. Um, and so the whole book and claim system that is currently being explored will be critical for creating this demand through these buyers alliances, buyer alliances. And uh, for example, the, the initial estimates from the buyers alliance uh, is uh, from SABA is that by 2025 there might be a demand for over 2 billion gallons just for these scope three emissions from companies. SABA has now also expanded to include uh, airlines as well. But the book and claim system is gonna be really critical for implementing this because uh, it, it allows the separation of the physical SAF from the sustainability characteristics. So it's irrelevant where the physical SAF is used and it allows corporations to purchase the emission credits without actually using the SAF. So there's a current pilot scheme that is being developed by the Roundtable on Sustainable Biomaterials in conjunction with AirBP. And they recently uh, engaged with Microsoft, SABA and United Airlines uh, for a first transaction under a book and claim system as they are trying to uh, develop the rules for, for the system that will maintain uh, the integrity uh, and, and ensure that there's no, no double counting. But this is going to, going to become more important and it will also allow SAF to be purchased in one place where it's being produced, but the credits to be claimed in a completely different country uh, so that the SAF does not actually have to be physically transported to the airport where the uh, credits for emission reductions will be will be claimed. Next slide. And I think as Steve also highlighted uh, the, this whole issue of linking policy to carbon intensity, uh, we think is very, very critical. Currently, you see the price of, of jet fuel and SAF uh, based on volume per ton, but placing a value on the carbon intensity we think is critical. And that policies that link these two will reward increased emission reductions of SAF for the greatest climate benefits. And particularly, uh, as Steve also mentioned, the low carbon fuel standard in California and even in British Columbia has seen a, a huge influx of very low carbon intensity fuels because of this policy in place. The policy is also technology agnostic, so it only rewards the outcome in terms of the reduction in, in emissions. And the proposed SAF blenders tax credit in the US is also linked to carbon intensity reduction, where a company uh, will be able to, to claim uh, $1.50 per gallon, up to $2 per gallon for 100% emission reductions. So it rewards the company for reducing emission. And what uh, Steve also mentioned is that a lot of companies looking at uh, carbon capture and storage and other measures uh, to uh, include renewable electricity, for example, using renewable hydrogen from, from biogas, um, selection of the most sustainable feedstocks. And many of these facilities that are being constructed in the US are um, going to be able to deliver SAF with 100% emission reductions. Of course, the, the one obstacle at the moment is that uh, things like carbon capture and storage is not included in the Corsia uh, LCA method, but this hopefully will be uh, in, included soon. So beyond the Corsia default uh, carbon intensity levels, companies will be able to use the methodology to then show the actual emission reductions that they are able to achieve. Next slide. And one of the things that, that is also crucial is that SAF policies need to address the competition 
with renewable diesel. So uh, currently, uh, SAF is, is produced uh, by facilities that produce mainly renewable diesel. And SAF is essentially uh, a, a byproduct. And uh, if the company does not see SAF as valuable, they don't have to produce the SAF because you can easily blend uh, the jet fraction into the renewable diesel if the diesel is more valuable. And because FAF production requires additional processing, such as isomerization, for example, it is more expensive to produce than simply making renewable diesel. And uh, so policy needs to address this competition uh, to uh, shift production to SAF rather than just focusing on uh, renewable diesel. And such a policy would be a fuel multiplier that allows SAF to earn greater credits uh, than uh, the same uh, uh, volume or amount of renewable uh, diesel. Next slide. So when we look at uh, potential technology commercialization and future SAF supply, some of these reports that I, that I mentioned um, try to show a progressive uh, increase in uh, volumes that are being produced and which technologies are going to produce these volumes. But I think that what we want to emphasize is that there's no silver bullet technology. And in our opinion, policies should be technology agnostic because uh, what, what we see also is that all technologies can contribute to different volumes. Uh, of SAF based on using niche feedstocks and regional conditions. One of the, the, the things about uh, uh, using biomass for production of, of biofuel and SAF is that uh, a lot of them cannot be uh, transported over long different distances due to low energy density. And therefore the regional production of SAF is gonna become more uh, important um, with other benefits such as rural develop, development. But that means that, that um, technologies that can access these regional feedstocks better in one area than in another area will, will then uh, prevail there. Next slide. So when we look at the, the technologies, uh, uh, some of the trends, potential and challenges, uh, we know that SAF, uh, from HEFA technology is currently the only fully commercial pathway and will probably be the main supplier of SAF over the next 10 years. We are, are seeing commercial scale facilities for gasification, fissure troughs and alcohol to jet being built and they will proceed towards full, full commercialization when we'll see the, the actual uh, expansion taking place to uh, next facilities. But we also believe that what is overlooked is SAF production through co-processing, which has significant potential. The pyrolysis uh, HDL pathways are also very promising, uh, but this is still in development. And the uh, e-kerosene from power to liquids is expected to, be, to make a significant contribution by 2050 uh, in, under the e refuel EU mandate proposal. Uh, there would be a mandate of 28% for e-kerosene by 2050. And some reports like the ICF report uh, project that potentially uh, power to liquids may have to supply up to 50% of, of the SAF by 2050. But, uh, but the development uh, will probably be slower and I'll go into more detail. Next slide. So with the, with the HEFA uh, synthetic paraffin kerosene from fats, oils, and greases. I think we must realize that the commercialization of this technology has taken place based on renewable diesel and HVO rather than SAF. But the reality is that uh, basically every HVO facility can produce at least a 15% SAF fraction. So if a, a, a company, a fuel producer uh, des decides to do that, they can separate out that SAF fraction that jet fraction, um, which, which will only require a limited investment. So theoretically, if you take uh, 6, billion, 6 billion liters of uh, renewable diesel currently and, and in production, that 15% of the, 
of that could very quickly become available as SAF. Now, um, the fraction of SAF from this technology can be increased to 50%. But uh, this will make the facility less economical because uh, there's a lower yield of, of liquid uh, fuels from, from the process. So that, that reinforces the idea that policy must drive uh, SAF expansion. Next slide. So the main challenges with the HEFA technology is, is really the feedstock cost availability, sustainability and quality. And in many cases, even uh, used cooking oil is more expensive per ton than the actual conventional jet fuel. So the whole issue around feedstock cost and how to reduce that cost by accessing uh, more waste feedstocks uh, is, is a critical issue here. Uh, the, the also, many of these reports look at feedstock availability, but a lot of them really look at only waste-based based feedstocks and so on, and uh, not really considering crop-based feedstocks and sust specifically sustainable crops, uh, because there will also be a lot of competition for these feedstocks in terms of food, uh, biodiesel, renewable diesel. Um, so uh, whether they will be enough for SAF is, is still, uh, I don't know, I don't think anybody is really clear how much is available and estimates vary from anything like 30 million tons to, to uh, 100 million tons. Uh, one of the things that I would like to, to just point out is that some of these feedstock assessments, as Steve also mentioned, there, there shouldn't be a problem with any feedstocks, but some of these feedstock assessments are based on feedstocks that haven't been fully commercially developed, and there are not yet supply chains established for these uh, feedstocks. And this is actually a critical component because um, policy that is targeting feedstock development and establishment of these supply chains might be necessary if, if those uh, feedstocks must become available for the SAF production. So I think it, it needs additional policy support rather than, than just feedstocks that are already uh, available with mature supply chains. Next slide. But the HEFA uh, presents a lot of opportunities. And one of the things that uh, you can see from this diagram is the high feedstock density of these fats and oils allow very large facilities and economies of scale. Unfortunately, the volumes disappeared from my diagram, but the, the HEFA bar uh, on, on the left, uh, the, the, at the top is a volume uh, of 1.8 billion liters. Uh, the blue section is about 1 billion liters. And if we compare this with the gasification and alcohol to jet type facilities, the colored bar at the bottom represents 40 million liters. So what we can see is, is unlike any of the other technologies, HEFA is uniquely suited to uh, uh, maximize economies of scale uh, because the, the feedstock can be uh, delivered and transported anywhere in the world. And as I pointed out with limited investment, every current facility, renewable diesel facility can potentially produce 15% staff and uh, with further exp expansion to maximum SAF can be achieved with greater investment, but will need the policy driver because if the renewable diesel is more valuable than, than the SAF, it is unlikely that companies will go towards uh, maximum SAF production, which will uh, significantly reduce the renewable diesel yields. Next slide. So the gasification and fissure drops uh, uh, here is... Uh, an outline of the process. And the first full-scale commercial facilities are nearing completion, Fulcrum Bioenergy completed their Sierra Nevada facility this year, Red Rock Biofuels is also in the process, and many other facilities have been announced. And the success of these pioneer facilities are really critical for us to see that acceleration and expansion taking place. Uh, 
currently two main feedstocks are targeted, municipal solid waste and, and residues, both forest residues, agricultural residues, and so on. But the syngas cleanup remains a critical issue, and particularly different types of cleanup may be required for, for different uh, feedstocks uh, and the types of contaminants they have. And because of the uh, problem with the low energy density of feedstocks, such as forest residues, uh, the economies of scale that you see with large uh, uh, gasification facilities based on coal or natural gas cannot really be achieved with uh, these biomass based facilities. Uh, obviously, there are some solutions that have been proposed, for example, distributed uh, supply uh, using pyrolysis oil uh, that can then be gasified, et cetera. So there are, are many opportunities to, to improve the, the economics and the production cost of this technology. Next slide. So direct thermochemical liquefaction, which includes hydrothermal liquefaction, fast pyrolysis, catalytic pyrolysis, and even hydropyrolysis. Uh, although the production of the bio oil is basically commercial, it's, the issue is really the, the upgrading, uh, which is still not at uh, an advanced technology readiness level. But there have been many research projects carried out that has shown that it is very promising for SAF production. And the other big advantage of these bio oil, bio crude intermediates is that they are highly suitable as an intermediate for co-processing in refineries, which can significantly reduce the capex cost of, of production. Um, and hydrothermal liquefaction is very unique in the, in the fact that it can use a niche feedstock such as sewage sludge and other wet waste, food processing waste, etc. And the high flex fuel project in, the, in Europe that was recently concluded showed that uh, a, a jet fraction can be produced from so it's sludge, sludge um, that uh, has very good characteristics. Next slide. So the challenges and opportunities of, of the direct thermochemical liquefaction is really that uh, because the bio oil, bio crude, as some describe it as a liquid uh, wood or liquid biomass, it, is, it takes the, the complexity and variation of the feedstock into the bio crude. Uh, so wood will be different from uh, municipal solid waste or sewage sludge or agricultural residues, et cetera. Um, and the upgrading still has some challenges, but there's uh, a lot of uh, significant research projects underway to address these challenges. Uh, in some cases, the hydrogen requirement for upgrading can be really huge. And what uh, has been found is that there's, if you use bio, uh, make bio crudes from algae, uh, you get very high nitrogen content that has to be addressed. And, but importantly for SAF production, these pathways are not currently ASTM certified. Uh, so ASTM certification will have to be obtained before it, uh, any jet SAF can be used commercially. And these uh, uh, technologies can also use low cost feedstocks with large availability. And particularly in terms of like the distributed supply chain, uh, the technology for fast pyrolysis is, is uh, uh, small enough uh, or at, at, at good enough at small scale that you can have uh, distributed supply or, or production of these bio oils. Uh, with transportation of, of those bio oils to a centralized upgrading facility. And this is a, a, a unique opportunity. Next slide. The alcohol to jet pathway is, uh, of course, you can go from biomass to sugars or from corn and sugar cane to sugars, uh, which can then be fermented into alcohols. Uh, Lanzatec also use waste gases or syngas for fermentation of, of ethanol, uh, ethanol. And then the alcohol can be uh, through a uh, commercial alcohol to jet process be, uh, be used to produce the SAF. The, that jet production step, step has actually been commercial for uh, production from, from uh, methanol to gasoline uh, that has been in existence for decades. 
Currently, uh, uh, only the isobutanol to jet uh, technology is delivering small commercial volumes, but the first full-scale commercial facilities for multiple technologies are under construction. And unlike uh, the other uh, technologies, uh, between 70 and 90% jet fraction can, can be produced from this technology. Next slide. So some of the challenges and opportunities with this is uh, uh, that if the alcohol it has a very high value, it may not be uh, diverted towards SAF production, but rather into the chemical uh, industry uh, for, say, plastics production and so on. And a lot of emphasis is placed on using advanced or cellulosic feedstocks for alcohol production. But uh, people in the ethanol, cellulosic ethanol industry knows that that has proven to be quite uh, difficult to, uh, to be successful. And, and therefore, I think that, that we should look at the use of crop-based feedstocks, uh, obviously, that are sustainable. Uh, but the, if, if one uses corn ethanol, for example, uh, currently, you can immediately produce large volumes of SAF, and companies like Givo has shown that it is possible uh, working with farmers and so on and, and changing a lot of the management, uh, farm management practices that very low uh, su uh, sustainability, uh, sustainable feedstocks can be uh, produced. Um, this technology also has a potential for reduced infrastructure cost, as uh, you can take an ethanol facility and repurpose it uh, for a new organism that can produce, say, butanol, isobutanol, which is what GIVO has done. Uh, the Lanzatec process, also there's the potential for using low-cost waste gases. And uh, this process is ASTM certified for isobutanol and ethanol with potentially uh, other alcohols becoming certified. And if this is combined with carbon capture and storage uh, from the ethanol production, you can achieve a very low carbon intensity or even carbon negative uh, SAF product. Next slide. So the, the power to liquids is certainly, there's a, a lot of interest in this. Um, and uh, Germany developed a power to liquid roadmap the uh, refuel EU mandate proposes a dedicated mandate for e-kerosene in the EU. Uh, Germany has put a lot of funding into hydrogen technology. And uh, this has got a very high potential for very low uh, SAF, uh, carbon intensity SAF with minimum land requirements. Next slide. I think the, the biggest challenge apart from technology, is that it's really one of the most expensive pathways. And uh, the whole issue of sufficient and additional renewable energy for hydrogen production is essential to achieve real climate benefits. So if you uh, use renewable energy, instead of using it for heat and power, you use it for power to liquids, it's a very inefficient way to use electricity. Uh, if you take the electricity and put it into a battery for an electric vehicle, it's six times more efficient than e-fuel production. So if there's competition for renewable energy, it must first go to the most efficient uh, applications and only additional renewable energy should really be diverted into power to liquid. So this can become a problem if there's not enough uh, renewable electricity available. And there's also the very high cost for direct air carbon capture, potential problems from a sustainability point of view with uh, point source capture, where double counting could, uh, could occur. And although many of the steps in the power to liquid pathway is at commercial stage, the whole integrated pathway is not commercial yet. Next step, next slide. Then uh, the issue of, of co-processing, which really means the insertion of a bio-based feedstocks into an existing refinery processing unit for simultaneous transformation of the intermediates with petroleum distillates to produce lower carbon intensity drop-in fuels. And the feedstocks uh, are, that are considered is really lipids and biocrudes, 
the main insertion points uh, are the fluid catalytic cracker and the diesel hydro treater, although the diesel hydro treater is most suited for uh, SAF production. And uh, there are some technical issues and they're still trying to figure out how to track the, the green molecules and determine the carbon intensity. But uh, policies such as low carbon fuel standards are pushing refineries towards co-processing because they cannot meet the carbon emission reductions just based on blending. So they are, want to use co-processing to actually transform the, the carbon intensity of their fuels. Next slide. So uh, this can potentially reduce uh, uh, cost by using existing refinery infrastructure, for example, sharing hydrogen production, upgrading units, distribution. It actually engages the oil refineries. Um, it's already commercially commercial for uh, co-processing of lipids. And uh, although challenges still remain for bio oils and bio crudes, currently co-processing for SAF production is approved at 5% blends, which is kind of limiting, but uh, increases will probably take place. Um, and co-processing is, is expected to become more significant. BP has produced their first SAF from co-processing in Spain. Uh, in Spain and uh, ENI is also looking at co-processing for SAF production in, in Italy. Next slide. So the conclusions really uh, is that commercialization of all technologies should be pursued, that there are technical challenges, but the high price difference is really the biggest ob obstacle, that HEFA uh, is playing the biggest role currently and will continue to do so but other technologies will start delivering SAF volumes, but that policies are really essential and the significant developments on this front in the EU and the US is certainly going to have a major impact on SAF development and critically that policies should be linked with carbon intensity of SAF. Next slide. Thanks Jack, I hope I didn't go too far long. Agree. Thanks very much, Susan. So uh, the, the questions have, have come in. So Susan, I'll, I'll aim this question at you, but I think we'll kind of segue into the panel discussion because I think it bumps into some of the other presentations. So one of the questions that came in, I think you and Steve, Sean and the others did a good job of showing that the heifer based uh, biojet is, is going to be the predominant fuel for a while. One of the questions where, I mean, you covered all the technologies that are, are, are evolving. So if you had to look at your crystal ball, what would be the predominant? I mean, you had the slide where you had the different technologies. If, if you were looking at, would you say that the alcohol to jet, the gasification process, what's the technology that's going to predominate or start catching up with HEFA? Well, uh, in my opinion, I think the uh, uh, acceleration in the alcohol to jet technology will probably happen faster than the gasification uh, fissure drops, um, especially if you use uh, ready uh, available ethanol from say corn or sugarcane ethanol that can still meet very low sustainability uh, requirements. So yeah, I think the alcohol to jet is certainly going to, to be uh, become huge. And then once the pyrolysis and HDL uh, start uh, solving the, the upgrading problems, I think that from 2030, this that's going to become quite big as well. So Steve, any, uh, Steve, Jeff, or uh, Sean, any comments on what you think is coming after HEFA or coming along after HEFA? I'll, I think the number of options that exist today, as well as those are coming, um, we're going to see a wide range, Jack, and, and I, I know a lot of people ask me that crystal ball question all the time, right? What's going to be the winning pathway, winning approach, predominant uh, amount? And the other thing that you have to take into account is the variation that you get in feedstocks in different regions of the world. They're, they're not equally priced around the world. So you can see one technology being able to take advantage of, of a low cost feedstock in a given region and not in another. So um, yeah, I try to avoid giving a direct answer to the question because it absolutely is a crystal ball question and a technology that we bring into vogue in five years can be a game changer. And totally, totally agree with Steve and just would add that 
I think the next tranche of, of pathways or pathway are those that are processing the waste residues and yeah. MSW. Agreed. And, and Susan made a great point about it's not just the feedstock availability, it's the feedstock supply chain. Yep. And that feedstock supply chain will, will drive the cost of, of that feedstock in both a good and potentially challenging way. Because as it becomes um, more available, it becomes more marketable, which, you know, and Susan made another great point about the cost of used cooking oil. Um, you know, the real cost, the underlying cost of used cooking oil is it's trash, it's waste, but it's got a market driven price. Uh, and so those, once you set up those supply chains, the market forces come into play. Yeah, and, and, and agreed. I think, uh, uh, Jack, as you know, you know, as we look at establishing those supply chains and some of these uh, residuals, they're, they're, all, they're all over the place. And I think each location has its strengths and weaknesses. And I think it's incumbent to sort of, for the, for the region to figure that out and then and figure out, you know, which technologies are available that, that can be used. And, and again, you, you have to consider all the inputs and the outputs. The, you know, I think we, we talk generally about the opportunities, but when you start uh, deep diving into what needs to be done at the supply chain and, you know, some of the, the issues that I think Susan brought up in terms of pretreatment and, and things like that, they're all solvable, but I think it's important to sort of identify those and, and start again, working to, to, to solve them to get, get those uh, rolling. So, so one question, and, and maybe uh, the, if you give me the answers and then we'll pull up the poll, but what came up in the discussion was really the, I, I, I think you all covered policy driven. So we need the policies to kind of get where we want to go. But one of the things that comes up is how do we differentiate between renewable diesel and, and jet? Do any of you have a, a suggestion on what policies could be brought in to kind of differentiate? I mean, Susan suggested something there. But uh, I know, for example, local refineries blending the jet back into the diesel because they don't get any benefit for the, the jet. A any suggestions on what policies could be used to encourage increased uh, biojet staff production? Not at the expense of diesel. I'll take the view that, you know, there's enough to go around for everyone. So I, I know it's going into renewable diesel. Even if you take a future look at where, where the refiner is going to be and in 10, 15 years if gasoline and everything goes away. So, you know, I, I, I like, I personally like the incentive uh, approach. I think, you know, we, we need to, you know, for an airline, I mean, fuel represents easily like 25, 30% of their costs. So, so notwithstanding the, the carbon costs and sort of the social costs of, of all that, but, this, you know, how do we, how do we keep aviation sort of uh, available for everyone? And, and it goes to, to the price and I think, you know, there needs to be some differentiator there to make it fair for, for staff at the end of the day. We've, we've seen multipliers, we've seen, you know, voluntary opt-ins, but it's, again, it's all linked to sort of the, the, the regulatory and policy sort of environment that you're working in that you have to look at. Any other? I mean, I, I think what's interesting here with, you know, being at university it tends to be R&D push. This is market pool. Clearly there's market pool here. So uh, I think, Jeff, building on your point, uh, it might be that we have to pay a bit more. Uh, so I, I think uh, that might be the way that it, it happens. Uh, I wonder if we could get the poll, poll up here. I realize we're running out of time, but can we get the poll results? So I think... Uh, Pretty even. <laughs> well, nobody likes voluntary building on customers, so that's clear anyway. But I think uh, all the other three are all relatively uh, clear. Any comments from the panel on... Uh, uh, was that expected or unexpected? What do you think? Yeah, I, I, I think it's, you know, it's often driven by a, a political bent and what you view as being the role of, of policy. Um, you know, policy can be used in different ways to, to address uh, different shortfalls of the marketplace. And I, I you know, I'm not suggesting one is better than the other. I think each of them actually have their pros and cons. Uh, but no, I'm not surprised that that you're seeing sort of the spectrum that's out there of uh, the different political views that folks have. And, and I think the view from industry is like, you know, we need policy to start the market, but eventually once we're scaled and once we're to volume, you know, that, that also reduces costs, and therefore should you know, change the policy at the end of the day. Right now, it's, we're transitioning and 
you know, it needs help, I think, to, to get to yeah. a point where we can, <laughs> we can be scalable. <laughs> So, so yeah. what I'd mentioned, uh, uh, the IA came out with a report today. So I think uh, many of you should have got this uh, renewable energy market report. So in that, they have a biojet section. I, th I think it's interesting because when they talk about the cost of a 5% blend and then you translate, uh, translate that over into a ticket, it's not that much, basically. It's, it's equivalent to about the airport departure tax I used to pay when I used to fly from Vancouver Airport. So I, th I think... Uh, well, part of it with actually paying a little bit more, I think, is actually not that tough. Uh, one last question before we sign off, because I see we're out of time. As Susan knows, I like the term biojet rather than SAF, because when I talk to people, I say biojet and they understand it right away. Whereas when I talk to the non-converts, I consider us converts, we know what SAF is. But what do people feel about that sustainable term SAF as compared to the term biojet? Anybody, any comments? Well, you're gonna launch me into way more than a one minute comment. I, I think, um, and I've totally violated what I said I was gonna do, but I, I think it's really important that we emphasize these are sustainable aviation fuels and sustainable fuels. And that when we say SAF, we're abstracting from the sustainable part. And so I've never liked the SAF term, even though I've made, got myself into using it like everybody else. Um, Biojet, I, there was some reason why we didn't use biojet in years past. Steve might remember, I don't, but there was actually, I think it was like a trademark term or something. Um, but, you know, it's, it's hard to change the language of people. But, but, I, but I do think we need to, to um, on a regular basis, emphasize that the thing that makes SAF SAF is sustainable. And you need to say sustainable often. Any quick comments before we sign off, uh, Susan, Steve or Jeff? Thanks. Thanks for having us and appreciate everyone's interest. Had a good participate participation today. So ha happy to continue to spread the message. Well, thanks, everyone. Thanks. Uh, great panel. Thanks, our colleagues at ETA. Again, problem free, technology problem free. So thank you, everybody. And uh, wherever you are in the world, uh, travel safe. <laughs> nice talk. Bye.